So today we're going to continue our exploration of the breath. And the reason why this is so fascinating, um, we did resourcing uh, and, and, and finding a resource for you. And then uh, we did sort of titration pendulum movement where you're going from your resource to maybe a place that's a little bit more uh, uncomfortable and coming back to your pendulum, coming back to your resource. And then we go into breath work, right? And we're probably gonna spend uh, definitely another two weeks on this, um, maybe three, depending on sort of where the discussion goes. But the part of a, a, a practice um, I feel has got to be being familiar with your breath, being familiar with uh, how to use your breath to your advantage. Um, we talked about the 14, you know, all the reasons last week, I believe uh, we went through of like, what, you know, why, why the breath, the present moment, it's impermanent. Um, it's a direct connection to your vagal nerve. It's, 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 it's quite an incredible resource if you can get to your breath as a resource, okay? Um, in these next maybe two weeks, what I want to do is specifically go over some research on breath work, uh, that has been done by, you know, places, uh, out of Stanford, um, university, uh, plays this out of the university of Pisa in Italy, um, that are all looking at breath work and these are published in um you know this first one that i'm gonna that that, that we're gonna look at this one published in the frontiers of human neuroscience which is a it's a great journal right this isn't this isn't published in like uh the the, the national Enquirer or something like that okay um and he uh uh he this this gentleman has been doing you know he's a neuroscientist he's uh he's a quite quite well published individual um, the title of his publication, which came out in 2018, uh, How Breath Control Can Change Your Life. <laughs> that's a big, uh, that's a big title in the frontiers for human neuroscience. Okay. How Breath Control Can Change Your Life, a systematic review on psychophysiological correlates of slow breathing slow breathing what is a systematic review a systematic review is when you go through a very systematic way of collecting and of reading all articles that have been published up to that date okay it's a pretty in it's a pretty intensive process you then vet those articles in terms of determining that eh, you have to come up with a with sort of an, a system of rating. And you say, does this article meet my criteria? So you define a set of criteria that you want your article, that you want all the articles to, uh, to live up to, okay? The article needs to be, let's say, peer reviewed, randomized controlled study, uh, you know, with a control group done in humans, Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what the criteria are. You just have to set the criteria and then go through a literature review using all the databases that are out there, trying to find all the research that encompasses this sort of material, get all those papers, rate the papers, and then do a review where you're pooling together the data and you're doing a review, it's sort of a synopsis of the entire field. Okay, does that make sense? So that's actually what they did, all right? And they tell you exactly, these are the databases we, we went into. These are the key words that we use to search in the databases. These are all the search findings that, that, that we had. We then read every paper and we made sure that it had this, and these are all the papers that we found, okay? Um, so for instance, 
very intense criteria to make it into this paper. Okay. Uh, from their initial database search, they found 2,461 abstracts and only 15, one five, 15 met their eligibility criteria and were included in this, in, in this review. So they had to be pretty rigorous studies. It wasn't, it wasn't ones that were just like, Hey, let me tell you about my brother breathing and, 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 and write us, you know, write an article about it kind of thing. Okay. Um, This is what they found. Mm, psychological behavioral outputs related to the above mentioned changes are increased comfort. Hey, who doesn't, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want a little bit of increased comfort? Um, relaxation, pleasantness. <laughs> pleasantness, I love that, right? How's your day? Pleasant, pleasant. Uh, vigor and alertness. Reduced symptoms of arousal, anxiety, depression, anger, and confusion. You'd say, what is that medication, doc? And I say, oh, it's breathing. You're like, wow, I don't have to pay you. No, it's free. You have it. In fact, you can be anywhere. All right. We all have it doesn't matter gender, race, age, we have it, right? And they looked at things like um, heart rate variability, uh, sinus, uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmias, EEG studies, fMRI studies, they looked at it, they looked at it all, okay? And this is what's so great. Slow breathing techniques, act, enhancing autonomic, cerebral and psychological flexibility, flexibility, right? That's that, that's what we're trying to train our nervous system to be, right? Resilient, increase our flexibility. Doesn't matter what age you are. In a scenario of mutual interactions, we found evidence of links between parasympathetic activity increased, Central nervous system activities increased EEG alpha power and decreased EEG theta power related to emotional control and psychological well being. Our hypothesis considers two different mechanisms for explaining psychophysiological changes induced by voluntary control, voluntary control of slow breathing. One is related to a voluntary regulation of internal body states, enteroception. The other, the other is the associated, is, is the other hypothesis is the role of the mechanoreceptors. So mechanoreceptors are receptors that we have on our body that are mechanical. What do they perceive? They perceive like shearing, shearing motions, vibratory motions, anything that you can think of that's like mechanics, right? So like you're shearing your skin. It feels different to like shear your skin than it does to touch, right? So you actually have these mechanoreceptors that notice shearing, uh, rhythmic pulsations, right? Whatever it might be. Mechanoreceptors within the nasal vault, nasal vault being our nasal cavity, all the way up in translating slow breathing in a modulation of olfactory bulb activity, which in turn tunes, tunes the activity of the entire cortical mantle don't you just love those words i don't make this up i don't make this up okay but when you have somebody who's poetic like this who obviously has a connection this guy's a, this guy's like a hardcore neuroscience okay listen to it again the role of mechanoreceptors within the nasal vault 
in doing what? What are these mechanoreceptors doing? They're translating. They're translating, right? So here's information coming in. It binds to the receptor in some way, or it's giving some sort of information to the receptor. It then translates this information, all right? So imagine like, hey, I don't speak Spanish. I need a translator, right? What do they do? They listen to it, and then they spit it out, right? It's the exact same thing, okay? In translating slow breathing, slow breathing, in a modulation of olfactory bulb activity. So your olfactory bulbs are being modulated by the breath that is coming through the nasal vault in a what? In a rhythmic fashion, right? You breathe in. Right? Which in turn, what does it do? Who doesn't want their brain to be tuned? <laughs> All right. So, uh, which in turn tunes. So you're using your olfactory ball. <laughs> I mean, is this stuff great or what? Like we came to, we came to earth to just learn this stuff and be like, dude, I'm going to go out and breathe. Where is this drug that you're selling me? Oh, it's my breath through my nose. Done. Okay which in turn tunes, tunes. So imagine your breath coming through your nose is actually vibrating your olfactory bulb, tuning, tuning what? Your entire brain, your entire cortical mantle, all right? Now he's trying to figure out how in the world does the olfactory bulb, does the modulation of the olfactory bulb tune the entire cortical mantle? And it's not through a neuronal synapse. It's happening through some other mechanism. That's why he contacted, he contacted me because he said, could it be through the cerebrospinal fluid? Have you ever looked at anything? Because the olfactory bulb could actually be vibrating the cerebrospinal fluid and the cerebrospinal fluid through the movement of the fluid could actually be tuning the cortical mantle all right we don't know that yet that's a very that's a very plausible hypothesis okay now what was the intervention included any technique of breath control that directly allowed the breath that directly slows the breath down to 10 breaths per minute or below all right that's what they included anything 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 uh anything above that uh below that okay um those are some pretty cool uh outcomes when you are looking at whether or not you should be including nasal breathing in your practice we found evidence of increased psycho physiological flexibility, linking parasympathetic activity, central nervous system activities related to emotional control and psychological well-being, and healthy subjects during slow breathing techniques. In particular, we found reliable associations between increase in heart rate variability, increase of EEG alpha, and decrease of theta power induced by slow breathing techniques most profoundly at six breaths per minute. Six breaths per minute. So, in addition, the role that the nostrils and more specifically the olfactory epithelium play during slow breathing techniques is not yet well considered nor understood. Evidence both from animal models and humans support the hypothesis that a nostril based respiration stimulating the mechanico the mechano uh, receptive properties of the olfactory epithelium what we smell with. Could be one of the pivotal neurophysiological mechanism subtending slow breathing techniques 
psychophysiological effects. Wow. All right. That by breathing slowly, we are creating consciously a vibration at the olfactory bulb, which is translating to a vibrational resonance to our entire brain. That's amazing. That's incredible. All right. So if you have any recommendations for people, you have like two seconds, right? You're on the elevator. Gee, I notice you're breathing really well. What do you recommend? Breathe with your nose and slow down. That's it. Breathe with your nose and slow down. Oh, oh. Thanks. And then they get off the elevator and never see him again. Uh, another article. The physiological effects of slow breathing in the healthy human. Slow breathing practices have gained popularity in the Western world due to their claimed health benefits yet remained relatively untouched by the medical community. Investigations into the physiological effects of slow breathing have uncovered significant effects on the respiratory, cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory, and autonomic nervous systems. What was that? Lipitor? Is that Lipitor you're getting? Is that, is that a blood pressure med? Or should I just start breathing? Key findings in, include effects on respiratory muscle activity, ventilation efficiency, Chemo reflex and barrel reflex sensitivity, heart rate variability, blood flow dynamics, respiratory sinus arrhythmia, cardiorespiratory coupling, and 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 uh, sympathovagal balance. Sympatho, sympathetic vagal balance, right? Sympathetic response, vagal response. Sympathetic response, vagal. Vagal is the parasympathetic balance. There appears to be potential for use of slow of controlled slow breathing techniques as a means of optimizing physiological parameters that appear to be associated with health and longevity and that may extend that may extend to disease states. However, there is dire need for further research into this area. So they did it. They, they did a similar study. This one came out in December of 2000. All right. They also did a review. For the purpose of this review, we define slow breathing as any rate from four to 10 breaths per minute. So they still have that 10, right? So there's this sort of like, what can you get to, right? 10. Uh, the typical respiratory rate in humans is within the range of 10 to 20 breaths per minute. All right. So they have a nice chart here. Documented effects of slow breathing in the healthy human body. Respiration, increased tidal volume. If we're just slowly, more slowly breathing, typically what happens is that we take deeper breaths. So that in medical terms, that's considered like a tidal volume. Okay. Listen to this. Enhances ventilation efficiency and arterial oxygenation literally you're oxygenating your blood better <laughs> by breathing via alveolar recruitment so there's this common knowledge in medicine that if you take shallow breaths what happens is that when you take shallow breaths where do you breathe from when you breathe shallowly you breathe from your upper chest typically right we do this when we're breathing shallowly Right, I'm just I'm, I'm exaggerating this a little bit more, and so what happens to the bottom what happens to the lower part of the lungs is they actually just start to. close in on themselves. Okay and it's called dead space it's it just it's like it's like areas that are there, but they don't they don't undergo any uh, oxygen exchange. Enhances ventilation efficiency and arterial oxygenation via alveolar recruitment. So alveoli are the tiny little patches, like the tiny little, little out bubbles 
that do the gas exchange. So you're now recruiting. So these are like closed because you're, the lungs like, hey, I don't need it. And then you're opening them up and now all of a sudden oxygen, now blood flows in that area. And now you have increased oxygen exchange. All right, better arterial oxygenation. Increases venous return, increases the filling of the right heart, increasing stroke volume, increasing cardiac output. You're getting more blood going back to your heart. You're getting your heart pumping more blood. Blood pressure, pulse fluctuations to synchronize with your heartbeat rhythm. May entrain and enhance vasomotor microflow through the capillaries to improve blood oxygenation. Increases heart rate variability. Decrease mean blood pressure. Improves gas exchange efficiency. Minimizes cardiac work. Buffers blood pressure fluctuations. Increases vagal activity, vagal tone. Over the next few weeks, you'll hear me talk a lot about the vagus nerve, right? The vagus nerve is cranial nerve number 10. You should be very familiar with this. This is the main nerve that controls our parasympathetic response. It's also, it not only goes from the brain down to every single organ of our body, but it's also a major pathway for communication from our digestive system up to the brain, right? We have a, a diminished vagal tone in our society. We have decreased vagal tone. We want to try to do practices that help increase vagal tone in general. We tend to be more of in a stress society. And, and stress activates the sympathetic nervous system, um, which is the fight or flight nervous system. And therefore, we have an imbalance. We have an imbalance. We have a lack of flexibility. We have a lack of resiliency in the dynamics of our nervous systems. And so what these do is because we don't have practices in place that help balance it, we're always stressed and on the go and feeling like we're needing to survive and threatened, et cetera, et cetera. We're always firing the sympathetic nervous system. And so what do we get good at doing? Well, we get good at doing what we repeat. And so therefore we get really good at doing it, firing our sympathetic nervous system. We have to actually do exercises that bring up the parasympathetic nervous system. Unfortunately, we don't do those exercises. We don't do breath work. We don't do, we don't try to relax. Or if we do try to relax, as soon as we try to relax, we feel the stress. And then we need to take medications or drink alcohol to help us relax um, because we have no way of doing it ourselves because our nervous system is imbalanced. So we take, you know, we take benzodiazepines or alcohol and that helps us relax. Uh, and then we're, we're, we're just uh, off balance. Enhances, listen to this, right? Enhances phasic modulation of sympathetic activity. The phasic modulation, right? Phase, yes, I need to fire my sympathetic. Now I need to relax my sympathetic and fire my parasympathetic. We want those, but we want balance in them, okay? And so this enhances that modulation. We want that flexibility, that resiliency in the nervous system. And you can actually train yourself to do this. Improves autonomic responsiveness to physical perturbations, such as standing, right? People sometimes stand and they, their blood pressure drops because they, they, don't have, they don't have the ability to, to, to constrict quickly to keep their blood pressure optimal. Optimizes sympathovagal balance. Who wants a little optimization of their sympathovagal balance? Da, 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 da. All right. <laughs> That's where we are. Here's an article out of Stanford in the Journal of Neurophysiology done by a neurosurgeon. So here's cool. All right. So here's the here's the premise. People who have uh, people who suffer from epilepsy um, have seizures that sometimes are not controlled well by medications, and so they do a procedure 
where they try to find the locus they try to find the location of um, the where the where the seizure starts and they do this all right imagine going to a neurosurgeon who who specializes in this in these techniques and the surgery involves uh taking your scalp off literally lifting your scalp up and you're conscious uh so you're conscious during this and your scalp is off and they have exposure to your brain right so you're literally you're looking at your brain okay the scalp is off and they're looking at your brain the purpose of the surgery or what they call the ablation is to find the locus of the seizure and to see can we get it to such a small part of the brain where if we can ablate that part can we then stop all seizures because usually what happens is it's one zone and that one zone will activate other areas and that that it'll it's sort of like a, a like a domino effect and the whole brain then goes okay and then you have you're you're seizing so this neurosurgeon is doing this procedure anyways right so he's doing this procedure in order to find where this locus of the epilepsy is they 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 place like 200 electrodes into your brain at the same time and what they're doing is every electrode is trying to find neuronal activity and so every electrode will perceive neuronal activity and they're looking for zones and so the closer the closer the the electrodes are to each other right if you have two electrodes here and they're noticing it they can get they can localize the zones as small as possible so that they're not killing parts of the brain that they don't need to kill because the ablation is literally they're getting rid of that part of the brain you don't want to get you know you don't want a zone that's this big so in order to decrease the size of the zone that they're going to ablate, they need to put in hundreds of these electrodes. All right. And the person is conscious, which is the cool part. So this is what they did. All right. In this study, uh they wanted to better understand how the brain responds to different breathing exercises they were already undergoing what they call int intra right it, within the brain intracranial eeg monitoring for epilepsy so they actually had 200 or more of these electrodes that were in different areas of the brain and they know exactly they know exactly okay we are in the amygdala at three millimeters in the we are in the hippocampus on the right you know they know exactly where they are okay um these adults were asked to take part in three breathing exercises while their brains were being monitored so they're already going through this and the neurosurgeon said hey why don't i just ask you to breathe different ways <laughs> how cool is that right and let me see where these electrodes are activating from right in the first exercise, participants rested with their eyes open for about eight minutes while breathing normally. They then sped up their breath to a rapid rate for just over two minutes while breathing through the nose, then slowed back down to regular breathing. They repeated this cycle eight times. In the next exercise, participated counted how many times they inhaled and exhaled for two minute intervals and reported how many breaths they'd taken. Researchers monitored how many breaths participants took during each interval, noting when responses were correct and incorrect. So they were monitoring everything, right? Heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate. So they said, all right, what is that? Just count your breaths. We, uh, I tell you to do that. All right? Can you pay attention to your breath? No, I can't pay attention to the sensation. Okay, count to five. Count your breaths. Okay. What are you doing? You're all of a sudden you're paying attention to your breath. All right. So they were trying to kind of trick them. Just pay attention to your breath. Start inhaling and exhaling. Mm -hmm. 
Lastly, participants completed an attention task while wearing a device that monitored their breathing cycle. In it, they viewed a video screen containing black circles in different fixed locations. They were asked to press one for one of four keyboard keys as quickly as possible when they saw one of the circles changing from black to white. At the end of the study, researchers looked to see how participants' breathing rates varied across different tasks and noted whether their brain activity changed depending on which task they were doing. They found that breathing affects brain regions, including the cortex and midbrain, more widely than previously thought. What they found was increased activity across a network of brain structures, including the amygdala, when participants breathe rapidly. So you breathe rapidly on purpose, right? Typically might happen in things like fear. Activity in the, in the amygdala, which is a powerful emotional center of the brain, suggests quick breathing rates may trigger feelings like anxiety, anger, or fear. Other studies have shown that we tend to be more attuned to fear when we're breathing quickly. Conversely, it is possible to reduce fear and anxiety by slowing down our breath. The study also uh, identified a strong connection between participants' intentional, that is paced breathing, and activation of the insula. So just that you just change how you're breathing and you're already changing, you're already activating different parts of the brain. How cool is that? In real time, right? Breathe quickly. <laughs> Pay attention to your breath. Oh. The insula regulates autonomic nervous system and is linked to body awareness. Prior studies have linked intentional breathing to insula activation, suggesting that paying particular attention to the breath may increase awareness of one's bodily states, a key skill learned in practices like yoga and meditation. Finally, researchers noted that when participants accurately tracked their breath, both the insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, a region of the brain involved in moment-to-moment -moment awareness were active. All told, the results of this study support a link between types of breathing, rapid, intentional, or attentional, and activation in brain structures involved in thinking, feeling, and behavior. This raises the possibility that particular breathing strategies may be used as a tool to help people to manage their thoughts, moods, and experiences. This is why I call breath work essentially um, neurosurgery because you are in real time right i don't need to do deep brain stimulation to activate these these i can just change how i'm breathing and you're literally changing the activity of the brain and you're changing and by changing the activity of the brain you can then affect neuronal synapses you can affect neuroplasticity you can affect mood behavior experience etc cetera, etc cetera. So there are a number of breathing practices. I don't know which breathing practice you're going to be attuned to, but I would recommend looking at various breathing practices. There's tons of yogic breathing, pranayama breathing, alternate nostril breathing, um, you know, holding your breath breathing, uh, humming while you breathe, um, holotropic breath work, heart math, uh, Wim Hof, whatever it is, okay? Find a way to incorporate some sort of breathing that's authentic to you. My phone has a breathing app on it. It's free. It comes with the phone. <laughs> it's my Samsung Health app. I go to it, okay? And I literally say sleep, weight, stress, heart rate, uh, stress breathe so it's under the stress right so it monitors my stress levels and then i push this breathe um it it asks me uh how many cycles per minute would you like to do and it's already preset at six interesting right where what, what what did that what did that systematic review find was the optimal breathing six 
Samsung, Samsung's paying attention, right? I can change that up and down if I want to, right? It also at the bottom, and this is the practice that we're going to do today. I'm going to take you through some sort of timed breathing exercise and you're going to see, oh my God, I hated that one or that one felt okay. Down at the bottom, there's a little thing that says five seconds and five seconds, meaning that the inhale is same. But I can increase this and I can go, oh, you know what? I'd like my exhale to be double my inhale. Let's say I put my exhale at 10. So now I go, okay, I'm going to inhale for five seconds and exhale for 10 seconds. And now I push start. Okay. And you see that little thing, right? That little thing. And I follow it. It goes in for five and then out for 10 slowly. <laughs> in for five. All right, that's on my that's on my phone. I had to do nothing. I did not pay any extra for this app. Okay. I recommend finding a breathing uh, mode, some breathing practice that works for you. you. It could even just be the one that we did last week, right? Just bringing your attention to your breath. And you probably noticed that just by bringing your attention to your breath at the end of that practice, breathing may have been slower, right? The most common one, like if you do heart math and they measure heart rate variability, uh, they have a thing that sort of, you know, it's sort of like a cyclical, it's almost like a sine wave it goes up, you breathe in, plateau, Breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And then what heart math adds is, you know, a feeling of sort of euphoria, love coming from your heart as if you're breathing from your heart, et cetera, et cetera. And you, and you practice this sort of breathing technique. And with time, you are going to increase your heart rate variability. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important next week. As I said before, if you have any recommendations that you give to any or you do yourself is pay attention to your breath and slow it down. That's it. We're going to do a practice where I guide you. You might not like this practice, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to guide you for, um, for, for, for three minutes each, and I'm going to only guide you for two minutes and then let you for the next minute do your own breathing. If you like the pace that we're going at, you can continue. If you don't, you change. If at any point during this exercise, you feel as if you're going to pass out, you just breathe regularly. Okay. There's no, there's no, no reason you should pass out. What we have found in the research is that there is a modulation. When we breathe in, we can actually activate the sympathetic nervous system. And when we breathe out, we're activating the parasympathetic nervous system. In, sympathetic, out, parasympathetic, in, sympathetic, out, parasympathetic. And you can actually see your heart rate change when you do this as well. So it's a very physiologic correlation. Now, what have people thought in terms of the hypothesis then? Well, if breathing out is parasympathetic and I'm breathing, why don't we extend the exhale when I'm breathing? So I breathe in four seconds and then I extend the exhale six seconds or eight seconds or whatever you feel comfortable doing. So that in the cycle of your breath, even as you breathe in and it activates the sympathetic nervous system, that when you breathe out, you're extending the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, bringing in more parasympathetic nervous system to your practice. Right? I may have lost people. Have I lost? <laughs> I haven't. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So initially, it's good to start with an equal number of sort of as my phone showed me as well, right? Five seconds in, five seconds out. We're going to do exactly what the research showed six breaths per minute. Now, many of you are probably saying to me, that's crazy. That's so few breaths. 
watch what happens when you actually do it. Okay. Then the practice is we're going to extend the exhale. So I'll guide you through this. I'm going to extend the exhale. Okay. To see, do you notice any difference between the equal inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, versus inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, okay? The research has shown that whatever number of seconds you do on the inhale, to extend it one and a half to two times on the exhale. So for instance, if we do four seconds on the inhale, we want to make the exhale one and a half to two times the inhale, which would be six to eight seconds. All right, so there's this sort of magic one and a half to two ratio on the exhale. Then we're going to do where we actually take a pause. We inhale and we hold. Hold, two, three, four, five. I'm going to be talking through this whole thing, and you're going to, if you can, follow the numbers, all right? So the first one, six breaths a minute. And I can almost guarantee you, you're going to feel as if you're, we're going too fast. Then we're going to, so we're going to do a five, five. Then we're going to a four, six. So it's going to be four in, six out. So you're still going to be in that six breaths a minute range, okay? I'm not changing the absolute number of breaths. What I'm changing is I'm changing the number of seconds of the inhale to the exhale. Then it's going to be a little bit more extreme. We're going to go four inhale, seven hold, eight exhale, right? And what I do for the first two minutes, I'm, I'm literally counting seconds for you guys. So it's going to be in two, three, four, five, out two, three, four, five. It'll take you a couple cycles to get used to it, which is fine. Just try to get on that pace and see how you feel. I'm only going to do it for two minutes and then let you, if you like the pace, to continue or you change. Just see, just see how you feel. Oh my goodness, this is tense. Feels like it's too much. Feels like I need to breathe more, whatever it is. Now, if you feel like you're gonna pass out, be sitting, don't be standing, you know, be sitting. If you feel like you need to lie down, lie down. Okay. And then I'm gonna go four, four, you know, four and, 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 and six. And then I'm gonna go four, seven, eight. Okay, and we're gonna go from one to another. So it's gonna be three minutes of one where I'm counting, you're gonna hear my voice. I'm counting for two minutes. I then let you breathe for a minute. Then we switch. Again, it's gonna take you a little bit of time to get into that rhythm, right? But then you're gonna have enough time to experience that rhythm and say, oh, that was really nice, or that sucked. Felt like I was suffocating, right? And then again, another three minutes, and then again, another exercise. Now, I do have to apologize in advance. Uh, if I screw up, like, you know, I have it written down. I've done this in the past. I have, I, 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 I do have it written down. So I try to be as precise as possible. I do apologize if I screw up, just sort of get, I'll get back onto the cycle. Um, okay. So this is controlled breathing exercises, right? Notice physiologically how you feel now. And then after each one of the three minutes, so you say, ask yourself, oh, wow, how was that? All right. We're breathing at six seconds, six breaths per minute or less or less. All right. And you'll see, you'll be like, wow, I could have gone maybe two or three breaths a minute. Are there any questions before I begin? <laughs> 